Hi everyone and welcome to our December live event with Heather Thomas. She's once again here to answer all of your quilting questions. So thanks for being here, Heather. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right, so we're going to start right out with some questions that we had uh, submitted before this evening. But if you are tuning in and for the next hour, if you have any question that you want Heather to answer, go ahead and type that into the comment box below the video and we'll work our way through as many questions as we can. But our first one here is from Claudia. And she says, if fabric requirements are given for a twin quilt, how do I increase them for a full or queen size quilt? That's a really tough question to answer without knowing what the pattern is. Um, because if it's a block that makes up that twin size quilt that only has four units in it, you're getting a lot of um, units out of your fabric. But if it's a block that's making up that quilt that has 20 units in each block, you're wasting, if you will, a lot of that fabric and seam allowance. Um, but generally speaking, if you double your yardage, you should have enough for a queen if you originally have the instructions for a twin. But I would buy two and a half times what I needed just to make sure that I have enough. Um, but doubling is always a good idea if you're wanting to make something larger. But remember, you don't necessarily have to use the same fabrics all the time. So if you started a piece um, and you got two thirds the way through it and realize you're not gonna have enough of this particular red, you can use another red as long as it's about the same color and not too different in the um, visual texture. That means the print that's on it. So if you were using a red that has little small um, dark red polka dots on it, you could get by by using a, a dark red or a red fabric that has little dark leaves on it. Those two could work in the same area of the quilt and once you finish all the blocks, you can mix around those blocks so that you're having some in one area that has the leaves and some in one area that has the polka dots. So you can get away with, with switching up fabrics if necessary. But generally speaking, two times, if not two and a half times, if you want to move from a twin to a queen. Perfect. All right. This is just a follow up because you mentioned something that uh, I do, uh, I guess, opposite is do you ever assemble as you go as you're making blocks to so say you've made like 15, 20 blocks and you start putting those together? Or do you wait until you have all your blocks and then you assemble the whole thing? I wait till I have all my blocks because generally I'm working very scrappy. If I were making the same blocks over and over again with the same fabrics over and over again, and I knew I had plenty of fabric, I cut everything out and I know I've got enough, then I would go ahead and, and sew the rows together because that kills the monotony. I don't, I'm not making another block. I can do something different. But I'm usually working really scrappy, so I don't want to put blocks together until I have all of the blocks together. <laughs> There's my cat. Sorry about that. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I'm with you. Sometimes you just need to change it up and, and uh, do something else for a little bit. Right, right. All right, our next question here is from Carolyn, and she says, should all miniature quilts be quilted? Some designs look better without quilting. Well, I'm here to tell you it's not a quilt unless it's got some quilting in it. <laughs> Otherwise, it's um, a pieced fabric. And But a lot of people will take a quilt top, like a miniature quilt um, a, or quilt top, and they'll put it in a frame um, with um, a, a, a set, uh, what's it called? Um, an inner frame. I can't remember what the inner frames are called right now because my cat's bothering me. Um, uh, anyway, you don't have to quilt it if you don't use it like it's a quilt. Um, if you're going to use it like it's artwork, you can certainly put it in frame um, or you can stretch it around um, a, a foam cord board and put it in a frame or you can stretch it around a canvas or already, already wrapped canvas and use it that way. Um, but remember, if you don't quilt it and put a backing on it, then um, laundering it is going to be pretty difficult because all those seam allowances in the back are going to get really messed up when you try to launder it if it hasn't been quilted. Um, and so consider go ahead, going ahead and quilting it, but doing it very, very simply, just a little tiny bit, enough to hold it together, because if it's an art piece, if it's going to hang on the wall, or even if it's going to set on a table, if it's not going to get a lot of use, it doesn't have to have heavy quilting. Perfect. And I know you've done... Um, I don't even know how many dozens of videos or you've done art quilts and you've done all sorts of different quilting. Um, so if you, you know, if she's wondering what kind of quilting would look good on an art quilt, we definitely have plenty of videos that you can look at. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of information there. Absolutely. All right, our next question here is from Patricia. And she says, when preparing yardage to cut, should I pull it straight before cutting or just trim the edge and discard the pieces that don't line up? I have found that some fabrics are very crooked when lining up the selvage edges. 
Yes and yes, um, and yes again. Yes, some fabrics are very crooked when you try to line up the selvage um, uh, edges. I, I can say that generally the more expensive or better um, manufactured a fabric is, the greater the chances are that the selvage edges are going to line up and that it is going to be printed true to the grain of the fabric. Less expensive fabrics are printed much faster and on a lower quality gray goods, um, and that's spelled G-R-E-I-G-E, -E, gray goods. That is the base fabric um, that the print goes down on. And sometimes that, that gray good can be very low quality or it can have an uneven weave. And no matter what you do, you're never gonna get it to go straight. So yes, um, I what I do when I'm gonna cut yardage is I tear the selvage off unless when I begin to tear, I see a lot of white showing near the tear. And that tells me that it's probably a lower end fabric and I'm gonna lose a lot of fabric to that tear, then I'll cut it. Um, but tearing it gives me the absolute truest um, grain. And then I will uh, line up that torn edge. Um, but yes, you want to then square it up and then go ahead and start cutting. Um, be very careful of your fold. Sometimes your fold will get off and um, you need to kind of realign it and then true your edge up again and then cut some more. Now, none of this is really important if all of your strips that, or rows that you cut or strips that you cut are going to be cut again down into small units, but it's very important if you're cutting strips for strip piecing. So um, if you're cutting strips for strip piecing for a Bargello or any other type of strip piecing, you need to make sure that it is as true as possible um, to the, the fold of the fabric so that you end up getting a nice, true, straight cut instead of a long piece that has a gernunkly thing in the middle, which is no fun to deal with. Absolutely. All right. So since you're speaking a little bit about um, fabric being printed on grain or the fabric being on grain, this question kind of goes along with that. You've talked about it a little bit in the past, but this is from Diane and she wants to know why her borders are wavy after she's applied the binding. How can she prevent this in the future? There's a lot of reasons why your borders could be wavy. Um, one, if you if your borders are not cut on grain, um, and that could be the crosswise or the widthwise grain, it just um, needs to not be on the bias or even slightly on the bias. Um, it, that's important. Uh, that's probably the most important time to think about grain when you're working with fabric is for those edges of the quilt because those edges are what give the quilt its all of its stability. Um, another what reason this could be happening is that you're pulling your binding when you're stitching it on. And I have seen people do this time and time again. And um, it, you, you need to have a little bit of pressure on that binding, but you, you shouldn't be pulling it out of its, um, its grain. You also need to use straight cut strips for uh, quilts that have straight edges. Do not use bias cut strips. Bias is only for things like double wedding ring and things that have a curved edge, a scalloped edge. Um, and no, a, a bias cut binding does not last any longer than a straight cut binding. Um, that's kind of an old wives tale. Um, so those things could be taking place. But it could also be simply because you didn't quilt your border enough and you couldn't tell um, that there was an issue with your border until you finished those edges with that binding. Um, your border needs to be quilted in the midline, meaning it needs to have as much quilting in it um, as half of the amount of the most amount of quilting and the least amount of quilting. So if you look in the body of your quilt and you've got areas that are quilted every half inch and you've got quilted areas quilted every inch and a half, then the midline of that would be every inch. And that's how close together the stitching should be in your border. It should be quilted in the midline, halfway between the least amount of quilting and the most amount of quilting in the body of the quilt. What that does is it tightens up those edges and makes them lay nice and flat and um, no wonkiness. And sometimes you don't see wonkiness until that binding's on and then you're kind of like, oh my goodness. So um, yeah, it could be any of those three things. Um, your, your border wasn't cut on the, um, the, on the true grain, um, your quilting wasn't enough in the border, or you pulled your binding um, as you were applying it. So I would look at those three issues. All right. Our next question here has to do with uh, choosing a quilt design, since we were just talking about that a little bit. But somebody asks, how do you come up with a quilt design for a quilt with busy blocks? Ah, that's a good question because um, 
you know, right now there's this thing where everybody has learned to machine quilt. Um, when I started quilting 30 years ago, very few people machine quilted and it was all about how beautiful the hand quilting could be. And then everybody started machine quilting, but it was that all over pattern that looked like the top of a mattress cover. And um, then it got to the point where machine quilting was acceptable and shows and things like that. And now it's become an artistry in and of itself. And that is the issue. Um, you kind of have to look at the surface of your quilt and ask what it needs and you have to pay attention to what it replies to you. Um, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Just because you can make beautiful feathers doesn't mean you should put it on every darn quilt top you make. Um, you should look at your quilt top and say what type of quilting will enhance this quilt. The busier your prints are, the busier your fabrics are, the busier your block units are, the simpler the quilting should be. We're working with opposites here. The simpler your block is, the simpler your fabric is, the simpler your prints are, the more elaborate your quilting can be. So plan accordingly. If you don't like to quilt a whole lot and you don't like have the skills to quilt fancy or you don't want to quilt fancy, then use lots of different fabrics, lots of different prints, big busy blocks and then you can just do simple quilting but if you really 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 like to quilt and you really like to show off your quilting skills then piece very simply um, I believe it was Diane Gadensky who wrote a book many years ago about 10 years ago maybe even longer I think it was called guide to machine quilting and on the cover of her book she has a very plain simple star quilt of some sort and it's in solids and it is beautifully and elaborately quilted and she, she knew from the get-go that if she wanted to quilt decoratively, she needed to piece simply. So if you've got a really busy quilt, very simple quilting. Well, what's simple quilting? And let's say you don't want to stipple. You know, everybody goes, oh, I'll stipple it. Um, and uh, so you don't have to stipple. You can do a wavy crosshatch, which means you simply stitch a, a wavy line diagonally across the center and then move those lines away from each other every half inch or inch, depending on what you want to do. Wavy lines all the way in one direction, and then wavy lines in the opposite direction diagonally, and you have this wonderful wavy crosshatch. That's a great thing to quilt on a really, really busy um, quilt. There are lots of really great simple things. Um, we have lots of designs um, and lots of uh, um, videos here on the website that you can check out and get some really good visual ideas for that too. Absolutely. All right, our next question here is from Melinda, and she says, do you always wash your quilt before giving it as a gift? I made my first quilt, but I'm scared to wash it. She's also heard to use a front load washer. Okay, well, um, I always wash my quilt the minute I'm done with it, unless it's an art quilt that has stuff on it that's never gonna be able to make it, let it be uh, washed. Um, your quilt gets dirty. It's, it just gets dirty. It gets dusty and dirty and your hands are dirty and you, and if you have any, any pets, you've got pet hair on it and all those things. It's dirty by the time you finish working with it. So yes, I would definitely launder it. Um, do you have to use a front loading washer? Goodness no. Those things only came out, what, two or three, five years ago? We didn't have them and we've been washing our quilts for a long time. If your quilt um, is not heavily quilted or if it's hand quilted, then you want to make sure that you don't let your sewing, ma your sewing machine, your washing machine agitate. Agitation is this movement, not spin. Spinning is okay because it just pushes the quilt against the wall of the machine and drains the water out of it. Agitation, when it goes back and forth like this, that can um, tear the seams, that can rip the seams. So, um, you know, if it's got far apart quilting or hand quilting, don't let it agitate. But if you've quilted, what I consider appropriately, meaning you've quilted every inch, inch and a half at the most, every half inch, whatever, close together, then it can handle just about any type of laundering you give it. Um, and I've always uh, erred on over quilting things so that when they go out in the world, if the person who ends up with them has no idea of how to take care of a quilt and treats it like a blanket, um, then it's still going to be safe. And um, I have a quilt on my bed right now that's been on my bed for about, I think about 14 years. And I wash it at least once a month because I have a cat. Um, and it is just holding up great. And I just throw in the washing machine and throw in the dryer. So um, it, it works great. Now, 
your batting is a consideration also how well your batting batting that you chose is going to launder and i think it's really important that we get used to reading what our batting say um, on their packaging or on the hang tag if it's on the roll um, some battings are going to shrink and whether or not you pre-wash your fabric all these things are going to affect the quilt if you wash your quilt um, this is how i do it i wash my quilts as i do all my laundry in synthrapol S-Y-N-T-H-R-A-P-O-L. It is a industrial surfactant that is very, very mild. Um, but what it does is it pulls out excess dyes, suspends them in the water, and then won't let them go back down on the, whatever's in the, the laundry, in the water. So you never have to worry about your quilt, any of the colors, any of the fabrics running. Um, so I, I launder it in that, and then I put it in the dryer until the bulk of the wetness is gone. I never dry it all the way. And the main reason I don't dry it all the way is because sometimes it can, it can end up wrinkled when it's done, but mostly because it's the dryer that does the bulk of the dulling of the colors in the fabric. Um, the dryer is really rough on fabric. Just think about your favorite pair of jeans after you've washed them 20 times. They're much lighter than they were when you first bought them. Um, and it's not because they've drained out of, of the dye, it's that you've dried them and dried them and dried them. So um, I just kind of drape it over something and let it finish drying. Um, and that will also keep it from getting too wrinkly. But if it does wrinkle all up and you don't like that, you can always iron it. You know, some people don't like the wrinkly look. So um, yeah, wash your quilt before you give it away. Make it nice and clean and tidy. Absolutely. All right, our next question here is from Dovey, and they say, how can I add to a starburst quilt to enlarge the burst? How can you enlarge a starburst quilt? I'm, I, I, I have a feeling your starburst quilt is um, uh, something that is, I think I'm thinking it's like a Lone Star sort of, but it's got the jagged edges to it basically. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, you can make the pieces larger, larger to begin with, meaning if, if you're cutting things two inches um, wide by one and a half inches or something like that, you can multiply both of those numbers by the same amount. Um, so if you had two by one and a half and you multiplied it by 0.5 and you're going to get the same um, uh, shape unit um, and automatically things are going to be larger. Um, and you can you can do the math that way pretty easily as long as you're using the same magic number to enlarge everything the same amount um, or you can put borders on it um, that's an option or um, i don't know if you if yours your pattern some of the patterns you applicate to a background when you're done other patterns you actually set in squares um, if you're applicating it to a background, then you can just applicate it to a bigger background than it calls for. Um, not seeing your pattern directly makes it a little bit hard for me to give you actual, you know, instructions. Um, but uh, doing the basic math is probably your best way. Perfect. All right. Our next question here is from Billy D. And they say, if I use paper coffee filters for the foundation when making a block for a string quilt, do I have to remove them before putting the quilt together, or can they remain on the back when the quilt is constructed? Um, they can remain on the back while the quilt is constructed, but remember that you're then um, uh, putting more seam allowance, more paper in more seam allowances, so it just makes it a little harder to pull off. Um, I like to take them off beforehand, but that's just me. I think it's easier to take them off one by one block at a time. Um, I was a, uh, I designed paper pieces patterns for a long time and did a lot of paper piecing, lots of mariner's compasses, and found it just a lot easier to remove them at the block stage um, than to remove it the, when the whole thing was done. I also found that it, it could get a little cumbersome sewing together with that added thickness of the paper in the seam allowance when it got to the block stage. But that just depends on the design of the block and whether or not um, a lot of seams go to the outside edge of that block. Um, and if that's the case, that it can be very difficult to sew together um, with the paper still on. So it's I think it's a personal choice. There's no right or wrong way. It's kind of try it both ways and see which one you like better. All right. That's always my favorite part of paper piecing is tearing away the little perforated. <laughs> it's just kind of fun. I like it. All right, our next question here is from Teresa, and you talked a little bit about um, quilting earlier, but she says, I've noticed the manufacturers of some battings say to quilt every two inches. That seems like a lot of quilting. Is it really necessary? 
Well, first of all, Teresa, I'm sorry to say that every two inches is not a lot of quilting. Every two inches is, is barely enough quilting for any quilt. Um, if you want a quilt to last longer than a few years, the, you need to quilt it closer together. Basically a quilt that's quilted every two inches and used well, used on a bed, used by a kid, used by a toddler, whatever, is gonna fall apart in about five to 10 years at the most, closer to the five year mark. Quilt it every inch and, it's, and you use it a lot, it's gonna last you 20, 25 years. Quilt it every half inch and it's gonna last you, I don't know, maybe 50 years to a lifetime um, of actual use, not just fold it up and put in a drawer. So um, just remember that the closer you quilt a quilt, the longer that quilt is going to last. Very, very, very important to listen to what the manufacturer says about the batting because they're not telling you anything about your quilt. They're telling you about their product, their batting. And what that manufacturer is telling you is that if you quilt this farther apart than every two inches, our batting is probably going to fall apart inside your quilt. They're telling you how far apart you can get away with and have their batting stay in one piece. So if the batting says every two inches and you quilt every three inches, then it can do what's called migrating, which means it starts to pull into one area and you get lumps in there. It can also just start to fall apart at the seam line. Um, and so you don't want that. You need to follow the directions of your batting. There are lots of battings out there that say can be quilted up to 10 inches apart. If you don't like to quilt, that's the batting for you. It's also, um, you know, not going to make for a, a very long lasting quilt though. Absolutely. All right, our next um, question slash comment is from Janet. And she says, thank you for encouraging me to keep working on my machine quilting. I want my quilts to be loved and eventually fall apart, not as a showpiece, but I want them to look good too. You've given me so many great tips. Her question is, do you recommend plastic bobbins or metal bobbins? I recommend whatever your machine really, really likes. So that being said, um, so like, there are some like Bernina's really only come with metal bobbins. Um, there are other machines that you can use both. Now, that's all well and fine to use plastic bobbins if you're only using cotton threads because cotton threads aren't too strong. But if you like to use monofilament, I've seen students wind a bobbin with monofilament on it that was a plastic bobbin and that monofilament just cut right through it and break the top off and spring all over the place. So, um, you know, uh, that can happen. Uh, so I think you have, if you have an option, I would go with metal. Um, because if you step on it on the ground, it's not going to break. Um, if you drop it, it's not going to crack on your tile floor. Um, they're just going to last a lot longer, so they're a better investment. Um, when I was doing a whole bunch of quilting, I got for my two machines, I had over 200 bobbins for each machine um, because I don't like have to have to pull thread off my bobbin, and I always match my bobbin thread to my top thread. So um, I, if you have the option, I say go with metal. Um, because I think they're going to last longer, they're, they're a better investment. Um, but if they're 10 times more expensive than the plastic and you don't want to spend that kind of money, you know, do the plastic. But do what your machine asks you to do. If your machine came with a metal bobbin, buy metal bobbins. If it came with a plastic bobbin, then you can use plastic bobbins. And I think, uh, honestly, when I, I first got my machine, it came with plastic bobbins. And I don't even think I knew metal bobbins existed because yeah. that's just not what came with my machine. Yeah. So, yep. All right, our next question here is from Sylvia, and she says, how do I choose the proper thread for each project or certain fabric? Well, you know, um, there's a lot of opinions about thread, and um, generally speaking, you want to choose a thread that is strong enough for the job, but not too strong for the job, and a thread that is going to match when you need it to match and contrast when you need it to contrast. I believe everybody can probably get away with, um, in it, when it comes to piecing, a nice medium gray, a dirty white, and black. Um, I do know people who like to piece with color. If they're gonna do a mostly blue quilt, they'll piece with blue fabric, blue thread. Um, and that's fine too. But if you wanna invest with, into, um, you know, just a nice basic amount of thread for piecing, that dirty white or off-white, black and a medium value gray are really all you need. Most of us piece with 50 weight thread because it is strong enough to hold everything together, but not so strong that it um, fills up the seam allowance and makes them more bulky. That being said, there are different types of 50 weight thread. There are two ply and there are three ply. The two ply is going to feel thinner 
um, but it's going to have the same tensile strength. My favorite piecing thread is Arafil's 50 weight. That's what I like to use. Now, when it comes to quilting, there's all sorts of different things out there. And you can quilt pretty much any thread you can imagine. The closer together you're going to quilt, if you're going to micro stitch every eighth of an inch, you're going to need a really thin thread, like a 100 weight or an 80 weight or a 60 weight. If you're going to quilt really far apart, like every two inches, every inch and a half, you're going to need a heavyweight thread, like a 30 weight. Um, when it comes to choosing color, your best choice almost always is to choose a tone. So if you know you want to quilt with a blue, but you have different varieties of blue in your quilt, and you want it to basically either not show on everything or show on everything. If it shows on some things and doesn't show on other things, then it's going to look like you have a break in the design. So you want it to either show on everything or not show on everything. To make it not show on everything or to show on everything, a tone is a great option. Tones are the grayed out version of a color, the dull version. And the way I look at a, a decision when it comes to thread is I'll choose the threads I think are going to work and I will unroll, unspool them and let them kind of dribble down on the surface where I'm going to quilt and then mash it down there and see how it looks. Does it go away entirely? That's a good option. Does it show entirely and I want contrast? That's a good option. But if I look down there and half of it's there and half of it's gone because it's matching some fabrics and contrasting with others, then that's not a good option. And that's kind of the way I look at it for machine quilting. That's a good idea and a good point too to actually be able to sort of try out your thread color before you yeah. quilt because you definitely don't want to quilt and then have to take it back out if you don't like it. So just yeah, putting it down on the surface to make sure you like it first is a good, definitely yeah. a good tip. All right, our next question here is from Pamela and she says, what is the easiest way to date a vintage quilt? I purchased a quilt top and I'm pretty sure it's vintage, but I'm not sure how to identify the age of the quilt. Is there a resource to assist in identifying fabric patterns? Well, we're pretty lucky with the internet. Um, you know, we can go to the, on the internet and research almost anything. Um, I'm not sure about any particular websites that you could go to, but I imagine if you Googled um, vintage quilt blocks, it would take you to at least a hundred different sites. And if you Googled vintage fab quilt fabrics, the same thing would be true. Um, and uh, you, you might be surprised that the piece isn't as old as you think it is. Um, or you might be very surprised that it's older than you thought it was. Uh, chances are though, it's very dirty. So um, if you're going to do anything with it, you're going to want to consider how you're going to launder that quilt um, either after you finish putting it, finish quilting it or, before you quilt it, it's up to you. Um, because, and I say this because if it's dirty, it's going to cause a more rapid breakdown of that surface. A clean surface lasts longer and a dirty surface attracts, you know, things like moths and um, the, the greases and oils and, that are in the dirt can break down the fibers in it. So the sooner you can get it laundered, the better. Um, I would just Google things and see what you come up with. and. Um, then share it with us. Tell us if you find a really great site. Absolutely, and we, we'd love to see pictures too of what the, the old quilt looks like as well, so we, we have an idea also. All right, our next question here is from Lynn, and they say, what are the best paints for fabric when you want the end product to still be soft? Ah, yes, yeah, the end product to still be soft. Um, you know, it all depends on how you paint your fabric. Um, if you really want a completely soft, if you want a paint that is not going to change the hand of the fabric at all, then instead of using a paint, use thickened dyes. Um, and so, you know, you simply use regular fabric dye um, and you can go online and get the recipe of how you're going to use that. But you're going to use a product um, that is going to thicken it. Um, it's it's sodium alginate and it's, it's basically algae. Um, and it will um, thicken your paint, your, your dye, and make it act like paint. And um, then when you launder it, it, it does a chemical reaction. All the excess comes off and you have a, 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 it hasn't changed the hand of the fabric at all. But most people don't want to do that. They want to, they want to do painting because it's simply, they think it's going to be cleaner and easier and neater and tidy and all that. And there's just, there's a kind of a 50% of one, 50% of the other when it comes to that. But um, I do have some favorite paints that I like to use. Um, I love to use ink. And so uh, Sukininko, it starts with a T, T-S-U-K-I-E-N-K-O, I believe is how it's uh, spelled. Sukininko has a craft ink 
that is made for fabric that is wonderful, especially if you like watercolor effects. Not so much if you want something that is really, really, really precise or crisp. I wouldn't use it, you know, to stamp with per se, um, because it moves on the surface of the fabric. Um, and, and so basically you want any paint that is going to um, uh, be labeled fabric paint and is sold in a fine art store. If it's labeled fabric paint and it's sold at a big box store, it could be not what you're looking for. It could be too thick on the surface and, and gets kind of um, uh, dense and that's not your best bet. So um, the two brands that are that people use a lot of are um, uh, PBO and the other is Jacquard. And I have always used Jacquard. The other is, some people call it set of color. Um, and uh, Jacquard is generally, um, they have a neopague, which is opaque. They have um, beautiful, beautiful um, metallics um, called Lumiere. And then they have a very liquidy one um, that you can use almost like a dye. And I'm trying to think of the name of it right now, but I can't come up with it. But anyway, um, it's it's also a great paint. Um, try not to put too much on. All of these paints can be watered down. And I always suggest that you water down at least 25% um, when it comes to the Neopeg from Jacquard. Um, and I will water down the Lumiere too, but if you do water down your Lumiere, make sure that you're continually mixing it as you use it. Otherwise it separates the metallic from the paint, but um, uh, use it sparingly. Don't, you know, just glom it on there because no matter what paint you use, you're going to get um, some thickness there. Yeah, and we absolutely have a lots of videos of uh, you doing, yeah, and and you do the same thing, th thin them down, and then I know, I mean, I personally am more of a visual person when it comes to shopping for things, so, you, you know, look at one of your videos and see what the actual paints look like, and that way you know what to look for in the store. Yeah, and one more thing about that, too, is that if you steam it after it's dry, it really softens it up, so even if it feels a little stiff, steam the bejeebers out of it when it's dry and it will soften it up because what it does is it relaxes the polymers in there and gets them to hold onto that fabric and it, the hand is a little bit better. All right. All right, our next question here is from Kim. And they want to know what is broadcloth? It says many online fabric sites offer it and they want to know if it's 100% cotton and if it's good for quilting or not. Okay, broadcloth is 100% cotton and it is quite similar to um, muslin, and it comes in different grades, just like muslin does. Um, but basically, um, it has um, it's, it has a nicer surface. It's a higher quality thread that makes it. So think of, of muslin as being uh, broadcloth's uh, cheaper little sister or something. Um, the muslin, the muslin is is kind of a utility cloth, and broadcloth is um, a much nicer quality that looks very similar to muslin. You can get broadcloth where um, the threads are quite heavy, and you can see the the grain, and it looks almost like a woven fabric. Or you can get broadcloth that's so tight that it looks like a really high end muslin. Um, that you probably thought was a muslin that was probably a broadcloth. So um, yes, people use it in quilting all the time. I um, Once I learned the difference between broadcloth and muslin, I never use muslin again um, because muslin is just a really low-end fabric. Um, even when you buy good muslin, it's not as good as broadcloth. So um, broadcloth is great. And, and a lot of solids are made from broad, broadcloth. So. Do you find that broadcloth or muslin shrinks more or less than other quilting cottons uh, when you use them? The brand. Yeah, it just depends on the brand. There are certain brand names of fabric um, that a, a lot of quilters love that I will not buy because they shrink, they wrinkle, they fray, um, and uh, I do not like a misbehaving fabric. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Nobody does. <laughs> All right. The next question here is from Glenn, and they say, if a quilt has multi-colors in the blocks, how can you sew in the ditch without the stitches showing in the off-colored fabric? You can't, <laughs> um, unless you use clear thread. So um, first of all, I, I don't understand why anybody wants to quilt in the ditch. Quilting in the ditch, I always say quilting in the ditch is just like driving the in the ditch. It's for drunks. Um, it's funny because it's so my favorite way of quilting. <laughs> I know, I know. 
it's so hard because the ditch color changes all the time and you know determining what color thread you want to use is very tough um, if you insist on doing it and um, you don't want to use clear thread then choose a color between the two colors or a color that is in the middle of the colorway so if you have let's say you have um, red yellow and blue um, red yellow and blue we've got of, of all those colors, blue is the simplest color uh, or the, the most easygoing uh, personality of color. And if you chose a dull version of that blue in a medium value, it's going to look okay on the rest of the colors. Um, whereas a bright yellow isn't going to look great on everything and a bright red probably isn't going to look great on everything. You could also quote something in gray. Gray, medium gray, medium dirty grays, medium blue grays, medium green grays. These grays are nice things that you can quilt with too. Um, and they pretty much go away on the surface of a quilt. Um, but like I said earlier, dribble that thread on that block and see what it looks like first because it's going to give you a really good visual of it. You're going to know right away how it's going to look on those fabrics and you can make a better choice. All right. Okay, our next question here is from Peggy, and she says, is it okay to quilt with embroidery thread? Um, is it, a, well, I'm, I'm assuming that you mean um, machine quilt with machine embroidery thread, and the answer is yes. Um, if you're, I, so like, I love to quilt with Mettler's 60 weight, 100% cotton, two ply. They call it, I think, ultra fine machine embroidery thread. Um, I used to buy it when I hand applique everything because it's the bee's knees for hand applique. And then I started um, uber quilting and quilting really, really close together. And I started using it for machine quilting and I love it for that. Um, so yes, you can. One of the things you need to be a little bit wary of is if you're doing um, machine quilting with um, either rayon embroidery thread or polyester embroidery thread is that if you have use that in the top and the bottom, then it doesn't knot off well. The, the, both threads are going to be very slippery and your knots aren't going to be very tight. Um, so you need to you need to kind of make your knots more more strong by stitching a little bit more often or a little bit more at the time at a time and your knots might show more or put a cotton thread of the same color, same weight or lighter weight in your bobbin. And then that cotton thread can grab a hold of that um, top rayon thread or, or polyester thread and hold it well, and you won't have to worry about your knot. All right. Okay, our next question here is from Patricia. And she says, uh, some people say they always starch their fabric before sewing. Some people say they never because bugs will be drawn towards it um, and she wants to know what you think what's your advice on starching well if uh, if i'm going to starch my fabric i'm only going to starch the fabric that i'm going to use right then and there because i know i'm going to use it up and i'm going to launder my quilt when i'm done because yes you know starch is made from animal products and yes it does atta attract a lot of moths um, so if you have an area where you've got moths um, definitely not a good idea to starch all your fabric and then store it that way um, uh, other people um, iron, you know, as they go, they, they launder all their fabrics, put it away somewhat wrinkly. But, you know, I, the way I always did my fabric is I only dried it till it was mostly dry. And then I just kind of draped it over a couch or whatever and let it dry the rest of the way so it wasn't too wrinkly, smoothed it out and, you know, put it on the shelf. And half the time I didn't have to iron it when I went to go use it. Um, but if you over dry it in the dryer and it gets all wrinkly, it's really a pain to to iron. So kind of launder better so that you can iron less. Um, but yes, I used to use starch all the time. In fact, I all the applique I used to do was starch and press applique. Um, but I laundered immediately when I was finished with the piece so I could get that starch out and it didn't attract mostly in my area where I lived at the time was moths. Um, so uh, moths love starch. So yeah, be careful with your starch. Be careful with anything you put on the surface of your fabric. Uh, keep things as natural as possible. I did not know that about starch. I've not used it that much, but I had no idea that it attracted moths. Yummy. All right. Oh, yes. Our <laughs> next question here is from Christine, and she says, can I use my regular sewing machine to quilt? Absolutely. Um, like I said before, it's the only thing I've ever used was a, is a regular sewing machine. Um, quilted literally thousands of quilts on it. Um, yeah, you could go out and get a long arm. You could get a sit down mid arm. You could get whatever you can afford and have room for. Um, but uh, your regular home machine is more than enough. It's plenty to machine quilt what most people are going to quilt in their lifetime. 
Is it a little bit more difficult? Some people think it is, but I think loading a, a quilt up on a long arm is pretty difficult too. So uh, they all have things that are that are kind of, you know, burdensome or cumbersome and you just learn how to get around it. So yes, you can quilt on that machine. You can uh, look at some more of my videos on that. You can take my machine quilting class and get a really good head start with it. Um, uh, but it is a joy, in my opinion, to quilt on your regular home machine. Absolutely. And I, I think the number one question people get about whether they can quilt on the sewing machine is whether they can do a large quilt and be able to move it under. And you even have a video that shows how to sort of work with the giant quilt and still be able to quilt all areas of it. Mm -hmm. um, on your home sewing machine. So that's a great one to check out on our website if you if that's the reason why you think you can't do it with your home sewing machine. All right, our next question here is from Shoshana and she says, I'm thinking about buying a rotary cutting mat. What size would you suggest? 12 inches or 17 inches? Uh, neither of those. Those those are too small. Um, uh, unless, you know, money's tight and that I do understand. So if money's tight, I buy the 17 incher, but if money's tight, I'd also wait until they were 40% off at one of the big, big box stores and buy it there. Um, I always suggest that you, you go to your quilt stores for all of your fabric and your threads and keep them in business and your classes there. But for those big investment things and a mat can be a big investment because a good size mat is going to cost you 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 dollars. Um, so having a 40 percent off or 50 percent off coupon at one of those stores um, is a way for you to get a much bigger mat for much less price. So I believe that you should get at least the 24 incher. Um, uh, the 36 incher is better. Um, otherwise, you're just going to feel like you need to go get another one uh, later down the line when the small one frustrates you. Um, so um, I say get the biggest one you can afford. Absolutely. I, I bought a small one to start with and then I ended up buying a bigger one and now I even have them right next to each other. So it creates an even bigger mat. So <laughs> eventually I'll just get one big one, but definitely, yeah, I agree. Get the bigger mat. Yeah. Our next question here is from Anna. She says, how do I sew a quilt without getting gathers? On my machine, I cannot drop my feed dogs. Oh, so you're talking about machine quilting. Um, well, if you can't drop your feed dogs, that's okay. It's not so much about your feed dogs. What it's about is a darning foot. So um, I have not met a machine in a very, very long time that you couldn't get a darning foot for. Some people call it a, um, a free motion foot, um, but generally speaking, the manufacturer calls it a darning foot. So I would simply go to Google and I would uh, enter in your, um, the manufacturer of your machine and the model of your machine and then the word darning foot and see what you come up with because I never drop my feed dogs on my sewing machine, even when it can drop its feed dogs. I always machine quilt with my feed dogs up. Um, so uh, it's the darning foot that does the work because the darning foot hops up and down on the surface of your quilt and allows you to move that quilt around. A regular presser foot presses down on your quilt and doesn't allow you to move it, it whether your feed dogs are up or down. It's the darning foot that makes the difference. Um, so if you've got a darning foot for your machine and your machine will not lower its feed dogs, you should still be able to quilt with a few exceptions. Every once in a while, I'll, you'll come across a machine that there's just too much presser foot pressure. And you can get around that if your darning foot has a spring in it. And you simply go in and cut off a few of the rounds of the spring so that it hasn't got so much spring in there and that basically makes it looser and then it's it hops easier and so there's lots of different ways to get around it um, if you can't find a, a, a free motion foot or a darning foot for your machine then you might end up having to get a different machine but it doesn't mean you have to spend a ton of money so then if it's not her foot that's causing the gathers any ideas what might be her problem it could be that you haven't basted properly. Um, basting, whether you do it with safety pins or straight pins or, um, you know, uh, hand based, um, basting needs to be done about every three inches or so. And a lot of people don't baste closely enough. It could be that you didn't um, properly stretch your backing fabric. And so backing fabric should be slightly taut before you put the batting and the bat and the quilt top on top. And um, smoothing as you as you baste is very important. If you've got puckers or fullness in your quilt before you've quilted it, it's going to be very hard to get rid of those 
while you quilt it. So bad piecing, um, inaccurate piecing can be the culprit also. There's lots of things that could be at play here. Gotcha. All right, our next question here is from Carol, and she wants to know if you ever get quilter's block, and if you do, how you get out of the slump. She also wants to know if your quilts talk to you when it comes to the quilting. Um, yes, my quilts were very loud and vocal when it came to the quilting, and um, uh, yes, quilter's block is a constant thing. Um, I, I, I call there's a dirty word I use for it that I won't use for it here. I'm just going to call it the storm. Um, whenever I'm making something, whether it's making a, a quilt, uh, making a painted quilt, making a piece of jewelry, whatever, and I believe that most artists own this and know this and understand this, there's going to be a time during the process where things are not going the way you want them to go, where you can't come up with a solution, um, where you are blocked. And uh, what I say is embrace it. Embrace it, embrace it, embrace it, and work through it and push through it and say, you know, you're not going to get the better of me because it is that storm, that block, whatever you want to call it, that is going to teach you more than anything else during your process. Um, when things come easily, we tend not to pay attention. So um, the, the, the storm, the, the block, the, the, the I just can't figure this out is actually a good thing. Um, look forward to it. I always look forward to it. Sometimes I throw things, but then, you know, I pick them up and I'm like, okay, this is what I've learned. That didn't bounce. But um, it, it happens to all of us. Yes, absolutely happens to all of us. Um, and so I just, I just kind of embrace it. And yes, my quilts talk to me. Um, my jewelry talks to me. Whatever it is I'm making talks to me. Um, my cat talks to me. Um, uh, because I'm a vocal person, because um, I believe in the relationship between me and the things I'm making. Um, and so I'm not just going through the motions and I'm not following somebody else's instructions. I'm having to um, come up with things uh, kind of uh, on the spot as I go. And so I have to ask the quilt what, what's happening. I have to ask the piecing what's happening. I have to um, ask the, the design what's happening and I have to pay attention. Um, when things work, that means that I'm heading in the right direction. When things don't work, it means I'm probably not heading in the right direction. And I need to go back and look at what I've done already and look at what's happening on the surface and pay attention to it and listen. Um, listen with my eyes, listen with my soul, listen with my heart um, and uh, heed um uh what the piece is saying so um it is a call and response art making is um you put out the call when you bring together your materials and they start to respond to each other and they put out a call to you and then you respond and then you put out a call to it and then it responds and it's a back and forth a back and forth a back and forth if you try to impose your will on it um it's not going to work very well and you're going to either make something that doesn't look good at all or something that looks very stilted and very formal um, and uh, lacks soul. So um, it's a symbiotic relationship, that creativity thing. Um, yeah. Spoken from a very creative person, of course. <laughs> All right, our next question here uh, is from Kathy. And she says, my walking foot is about 10 years old and doesn't seem to be working like it used to. Do they have a lifespan? Uh, yeah, and, and um, I have discovered that the cheaper they are, the less long they last, like some things, other things in life. Um, uh, there are certain brands, especially if they're generic, meaning they'll fit lots of different brands that don't last very long at all, um, five years maybe. Um, you can try oiling it, um, putting um, sewing machine oil on its joints and see if that helps it. Um, you can try tightening up if there's any screws um, that might have come loose. Um, but there is a chance that you might have to buy a new one. Um, so yeah, they do have a lifespan because they have internal parts. They're not just a piece of metal that you stick on the you know bottom of your um, machine. Uh, they they have internal working parts. So yeah, it could it could be worn out. It could have had its day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, our next question here is from Pam, and she says, "When I want to make a smaller quilt than the pattern size says." Do I need to resize the block or just simply make fewer blocks? It depends. It depends on how big the block is. It depends on how much smaller you want to go. Um, if you're say you, you have a, you're going to make a log cabin and the blocks are 12 inches um, and you have instructions for making a twin and you only want to make a throw, well then no, you don't need to don't need to change the block size. But if you're making your instructions are for a queen size, and uh, the block is a star, 
and you want to have the same sort of um, look as that quilt, but you want to do it for the wall and make it small, then I would definitely reduce the block size. Um, I think that's important. Uh, to reduce the block size, you, you can, um, a lot of, uh, it's, it can be difficult for people to understand how easy it is to reduce the block size of what I would call quote unquote normal blocks. Quote unquote normal blocks are blocks that fit into the four patch, nine patch, 12 patch, 16 patch, not 12 patch, but 16 patch, meaning that um, they're made up of equal size units. So two squares on top of two more squares would be a four patch. Um, three squares with three squares with three squares would be a nine patch. Um, four squares, four squares, four squares would be a 16 patch. So if you're working with a, a, a block that is a essentially a nine patch, a lot of stars are nine patches, um, then it's easy to reduce it to a, um, a from a 12 inch block down to a nine inch block or from a 12 inch block down to a six inch block, as long as you can divide your finished number by three, because that's how many units make up a row in that block. Um, and so uh, I, I have some videos uh, out on how to do that and a new class coming up on um, design um, for designing your first quilts or your more traditional quilts. Um, and uh, not that I'm trying to sell you that class or anything, but it will take some of the difficulty out of it for you. Um, another thing that you can do is uh, there are quite a few good block books out there that will show you here's a block and here's how to make this block in six different sizes. And when you understand how that block actually works, then the math won't, won't, won't scare you as much as it does. Um, when you understand how that the building blocks of the block, basically. Absolutely. And I think it helps. Um, you've talked about this before too, is, is how you kind of got into quilting, having to figure out your own patterns and your own right. quilt block patterns. Right. Whereas if someone comes into it having, okay, if it says it's two inches, cut two inches, you know, right. so just kind of playing around. Um, yeah. Yeah, if all you've ever done is follow instructions and you didn't have to think about it, you just said, oh, I have to cut these all two and all these four and this goes on to that because that's what the instructions said. You know, my first quilts, uh, my first quilt, the blocks, uh, my grandmother, they were her blocks and I asked for her patterns and her instructions and she said the blocks were the patterns and instructions. And, and so I had to measure every single unit and add the seam allowance and figure out what the best way was to cut it. And so from the very beginning, I understood what made up those blocks and that made everything so much easier for me from then on i could easily you know change the size of a block without even thinking about it mm -hmm. absolutely all right our next question here is from mart and they say what is the best batting to use for hand quilting when it's a large quilt um well it depends on you know a lot of a lot of things um empress by um uh uh what's it called? Um, I'll think of the name brand, but the, the it's called Empress, is my favorite thing for, for hand quilting. It's a mixture of, I believe, silk, cotton, uh, tencel, which is like rayon, and um, either wool or bamboo, I can't remember which, um, but it's quite thin and um, uh, very needleable. Um, basically, you want a batting that is not dense. Uh, one of the hardest, in my opinion, uh, battings to uh, hand quilt through is warm and natural because it's very dense, um, but it's great for, you know, machine quilting. Um, so if the batting has drapeability, when you set it on your hand and it, if it drapes over the edges of your hand, it's going to be easier to hand quilt. Um, you, you can do an amazing job of hand quilting with wool or silk. You, you, you just don't have to even think about it because it's got all these poofy air areas and it quilts just like um, polyester. And you know, a lot of people like polyester because it hand quilts so easily, um, but I think it's bad, 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 bad. Um, basically just nothing dense, nothing too dense and definitely nothing too thick. All right, yes, I think if anyone has ever tuned in before, we know your thoughts on polyester batting. <laughs> All right, our next question here is from Lorraine, and she says, I have a quilt with pointed edges. What is the best way to finish it? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by pointed edges. So, um, well, I, I was just going to say she, she has a little, um, uh, little V's in parentheses. So I'm assuming yeah. a very, very sharp point versus yeah. like a 90 degree. Yeah. So um, you have a couple options of, of what you can do. Um, if you want to keep those points on there, uh, you're, you're, one of the best things that you can do is you can um, basically uh, 
kind of pillowcase those by sewing a long strip of fabric on there, sewing around the edge of that with the face, the fabrics right sides together. And then uh, you're not gonna, you're gonna sew around the zigzag itself, not along the bottom edge of the fabric. You wanna be able to turn that fabric over and push out all those little um, uh, zigzags. You have to cut little bits inside the, the corners where it goes, the indention goes in so that you can get that to be smooth. And then you put your backing on, your batting on and your backing on. And when you're done with the quilt, you turn under the edge of your excess backing so that it's flush with that, that edge of the quilt. And then you have a finished edge to those, all those triangles. It is a pain in the hiney to do, but it can be done. Um, so my, chances are um, that design meant, was meant to have those triangles cut off um, when you were done before you quilted it or after you quilted it before you bound it. I'm not sure because I don't know the design for the quilt itself. Um, if it is um, prairie points that is on that is on there, they already are finished basically. And after you've sewn your prairie points to the edge of your quilt, you're going to again quilt the whole quilt. Make sure that you have excess back backing, um, and you do not quilt uh, in the last quarter inch of the quilt, so that you can trim your backing fabric a quarter inch bigger all the way around, turn it in, and then whip stitch it to the back of. Um, the, the bottom edge, a quarter inch up from the bottom edge of those um, prairie points. And that's how prairie points go put up, get put on. So, Well, I'm sure it's going to be complicated, but I'm sure it's going to look really cool and it's done. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Our next question here is from Leslie. And she says, is it best to quilt the top before doing any kind of binding? Absolutely. 100%. Never put binding on a quilt. Not, not even pretend on the top um, until excuse me, until after the quilting is done, um, things change in the quilting. And to sew the binding to the top of the quilt um, beforehand would be weird because it wouldn't be going through the edge of the by, by, batting and backing fabric and it needs to do that. Um, so no, bat, batting, excuse me, binding does not go on until all the quilting is finished. Absolutely, and you've, and you've talked to uh, before about when you are doing your quilting, how um, you're kind of being able to smooth things out. And exactly. You know, a lot of times you have to end up squaring up your, your finished yeah. edges. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Not till the end. It wouldn't work. <laughs> okay. Our next question here is from Tina and she says, do you have to wash your fabric first and then iron it before cutting out your pieces? You know, we've talked about this a little bit before with pre-washing. Yeah, it's a, it's a personal choice. Um, some people are hard uh, dyed in the wool uh, pre-washers and others don't want to pre-wash. Um, I'm a, I was always a pre-washer because um, I was bitten many times by fabrics that, that I didn't pre-wash in the beginning. And when I went to go launder that quilt, um, I then ended up with some um, running. Um, and so there's two things that can happen when your fabric is wet. Uh, when you launder something for the first time, um, uh, the excess dyes that are sitting on the surface or pigments that are sitting on the surface um, can, are, can come off. And when they come off, they can go back down on other portions of the quilt. Also, if two fabrics are sitting next to each other on top of each other while they're wet, um, they can transfer color. So one is actually running, the color's running off of it. The other is because they're sitting on top of it, they're just doing a tr color transfer. So um, if you pre-wash your fabrics, it makes using those quilts a lot easier in the long run. But there are some people who like the way the fabric feels when it's fresh and from the store and it's stiff. They like the way it feels when it comes to piecing and when it comes to cutting. And if that's the case, you can always starch. But like we said earlier in the program, make sure you only starch what you're going to use right away because um, if you starch all of your fabrics and put them up on the shelves, you can attract buggies um, and moths and things like that who love to eat starch for lunch. Which is such a weird thing to <laughs> yeah, I don't even know, think about. All right, we have a follow-up question to something that we talked about earlier, um, which I, I think it's fitting that we you know throw it in again this month, but Carol wants to know why polyester batting is bad. <laughs> polyester batting is from the devil and it smells like smoke says heather thomas um why it's bad is because it's highly 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 flammable as is minky anything polyester is plastic and when it catches fire 
it turns into hot molten liquid plastic. It's also full of all sorts of carcinogens. Um, unfortunately, if a house fire starts, what most people have been taught to do is to grab a blanket. So if they get catch on fire, they can roll out in that blanket or to put that blanket on to protect them if falling embers are happening. If that blanket is a quilt that's made with polyester batting, um, it can really do a lot of damage. Um, I had a, a, a family member um, who was who fell into a fire at a young age and um, a polyester waffle weave blanket was thrown on her and it took uh, nine months to debride all of that out of her body. Had it been a cotton quilt, the, it would have ashed away. So um, polyester is very dangerous. And the last thing I would ever put in a baby quilt is polyester of any sort. Um, it's, it's just dangerous and it's not good for our, it's made out of petroleum. It's not good for our, our earth. Um, and, um, you know, there's just so many other better options. If you really want that poof of polyester and that ease of polyester and laundering, then choose echo batting, E-C-O batting. It's made out of corn. And when it catches fire, it turns into water vapors. Um, so very safe, um, wonderful batting to use for kids quilts and charity quilts and all that sort of stuff. I actually just wrote that one down last time you talked about it so I can start using it in mine because I had never heard of a batting that turned into water vapor. So I thought that was pretty darn cool. It is cool. All right. Well, and that, that's all we have for tonight. I want to thank everyone for joining us and for submitting questions ahead of time uh, over the last hour. And definitely want to thank you, Heather, for answering everyone's questions. Thanks for uh, Wonderful, as always. And we hope you all tune back in next month. And Heather will be back again and we'll be answering even more questions. Have a good yeah. night, everyone. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.